Welcome back, networking enthusiasts. In today's world, there is an expectation that every site you go to, every application you use is always available and is always responsive. That compels software developers to craft code that's resilient to failure and utilizes services that are highly available. It also makes software architects, cloud architects, SREs, network engineers design their environments in a way that it can withstand any unforeseen challenges. Today, I'd like to talk about EPVS, a layer for load balancer built into the Linux kernel that is often used to achieve highly available services. I will show you how to set it up and what it can do. My name is Philip. Let's get started. EPVS, which stands for IP Virtual Server, is a piece of software that was specifically designed for load balancing in mind. Its primary purpose is to build scalable network services. EPVS is part of Linux kernel and operates at layer 4, so it's dedicated only for three protocols, TCP, UDP, and SCTP. EPVS relies on certain modules inside the NetFilter framework to redirect packets and provide efficient load balancing. Since the processing happens in the kernel, it has a very good performance. EPVS supports three packet forwarding methods, NAT, tunneling, and direct routing. EPVS supports eight balancing algorithms, round robin, weighted round robin, list connection, weighted list connection, locality-based list connection, locality-based list connection with replication, destination hashing, and source hashing. There are also some additional, more exotic variations. Let's dive right in. Here's the networking topology we'll be working with today. There are two networks, client network with 192.168.10-24 range and server network with 192.168.12-24 range. In the middle, there's a router connected to the client network with 10.200 IP and to the server network with 12.254 IP. We also have our load balancer attached to the client network with 10.230 IP and to the server network with 12.230 IP. On the server network, we have server 1 with 12.231 IP and server 2 with 12.232 IP. On the client network, we have a client with 10.231 IP. Just in mind, that the router is the default gateway for the servers. First thing we need to do is enable EPV4 forwarding as it's not enabled by default. This will allow our balancer to route packets between networks. Then I will install EPVS ADM, that's the application used to set and manipulate EPVS rules. You start EPVS configuration by creating a virtual service at the front-end layer. Afterward, you add backend nodes, known as real servers, which are responsible for handling the traffic. First, we need to define a virtual IP that will be used by our clients to reach our service. We'll do that with EPVS ADM uppercase A. Uppercase commands maintain virtual services and lowercase commands maintain backend servers that are associated with the virtual service. Uppercase A will create a new service and lowercase a will add a real server to the virtual service. Next, we need to specify the protocol type. Dash T is for TCP, dash U is for UDP. We'll be balancing HTTP traffic that runs on top of TCP, so I will provide dash T. Then let's provide a virtual IP and port uh, where we'll be receiving traffic. I will pick a free IP from the client network. Finally, let's specify the scheduling method with dash S option. That's the algorithm to allocate TCP connections to backend servers. Let's go with simple round robin with RR option. To list our virtual services, let's use dash L option followed by dash N option, so TCP port will be displayed in numeric format. The output will show the protocol, virtual IP and port, as well as load balancing algorithm. Unlike AJ Proxy, Nginx, or other application layer load balancing solutions that operate in user mode, in EPVS you won't find an application process 
nor a listening socket as EPVS operates in kernel. Instead, we discover that two kernel modules have been automatically loaded. OK, now let's add two backend servers. To do that, I will issue EPVS ADM lowercase a, that stands for add, then specify the service type and provide the virtual IP address and port. Next, we'll put the backend server IP and port. Finally, let's provide the packet forwarding method. First method I'd like to show you is masquerading. To set it up, we just put dash "-m". What it does is just a simple translation of the destination IP, a dnat. Once the EPVS balancer gets the packet, the destination IP, that is the VIP, is replaced with the real server IP. Then the packet is forwarded to the backend server. NAT mode is often used when the backend servers and client machines are in separate networks. In other words, the clients that initiate the traffic does not have direct access to real servers and all traffic goes via the load balancer. Let's validate our configuration. Here's the service. Load balancing algorithm is round robin. Here's the backend server and port. Forwarding method is NAT. Weight of this node is 1. Let me add a second backend node with 192.168.12.232 IP. The EPVS ADM tool handling and display is very similar to IP tables. The output is neat and tidy. Let's check if our backend servers are operational. I will call the service on server 1 and service on server 2. Let's try calling the service from the load balancer via the virtual IP. It does not work, but why? If we run a TCP dump on the servers and rerun the test from the balancer, we see that the destination address points to our server. That's good. However, the source IP is the balancer IP that's on the client network. So the reply packets will be sent to the server's default gateway and not to the balancer. There are two ways to address this issue. The easiest and the recommended one is to make your load balancer your default gateway. With this approach, any packets arriving to the backend servers will have to be routed back to the balancer. Let's try that. I will remove the existing default gateway on server 1 and add a new default gateway pointing to the balancer. Let's do the same thing for server 2. Remove the default gateway, set new default gateway pointing to load balancer. Now let's try calling the service a few more times. It works. Another way to solve it, uh, if you cannot make your load balancer the default gateway, is to perform a source address translation as the packets go out to the backend servers. Basically, for packets going from the balancer to the backend server, you replace the source IP with the balancer IP. That will require involving your firewall for connection tracking and translation, so it's not the best option. Anyway, let's try that. I will revert the default gateway on both servers. Now let's create a NFTables configuration file on the balancer. First, let's clear the existing configuration with flash ruleset command. Then create a new EPV4 table called NAT and create a new chain named post routing. We'll attach to the post routing hook of type NAT as we'll be doing network address translation. Finally, let's match packets going out via ETH0 interface, that's the interface towards our backend server, and perform masquerade. That is, swap the source IP of the packet with the interface IP. Thanks to that, backend servers will send the traffic back to the load balancer and not to the default gateway. Let's save and load the configuration. Now let's try connecting one more time. It's not working, but why? 
By default, connections handled by the EPVS are not tracked by connection tracking. We can tweak that by setting the net EPV4 VS contract kernel parameter to 1. Now let's try connecting one more time. Works. I will go to our client machine and try calling this service. It does not work, but again, why? Mind that we don't have the virtual IP assigned to the load balancer, so nothing is responding to client's ARB requests. Let's go to the balancer and open network configuration. Now let's assign the virtual IP as a secondary IP to ETH1 interface. I will save and reload the configuration. OK, IP is there. Let's try connecting again from the client machine. Now it works. There's yet one more option to denote a virtual service. Instead of providing the protocol, IP address and port, you can specify firewall mark. In other words, you mark a specific traffic on the firewall and EPVS is directing the traffic to a service based on that mark. Let me show you how it works. First, let's clear EPVS configuration. Next, let's create a new service with dash A. Then, instead of providing the IP address, I will provide dash F and the number of mark that was set on the firewall. Let's say 1, 2, 3, 4. Finally, let me set the load balancing algorithm to round robin. Now, we need to add backend servers. I will start with dash lowercase a to indicate I want to add a new backend server. Dash f to specify the firewall mark it refers to and dash r to specify the backend server. At the end, I will set the packet forwarding method to masquerade. Let's add uh, the second server to the mix. If we list the configuration, the service is of FWM type that indicate firewall mark. Here's the mark number. Backend servers IP and ports and forwarding type. Okay, our EPVS setup is ready. Let's mark the packets on the firewall. I will open Firewall configuration, add another chain and name it forward. I will attach to the pre-routing hook on the mangle priority. We want to match traffic arriving on ETH1 interface, that's interface pointing towards our clients, to destination IP 10.229 on TCP port 8080. Traffic will be marked with value 1234. Now let's save and reload the configuration. Finally, I will go to the client and try calling the service a few times. It works. Packets arriving at the balancer on port 8080 were marked on the firewall and then EPVS used that mark to balance the traffic between the backend servers. This technique can greatly simplify configuration if you want to cover multiple IP addresses or handle more advanced scenarios. If you look at the EPVS ADM output, we can see the number of active and inactive connections. Let's inspect another way EPVS can forward packets, that's gatewaying, also called direct routing mode or direct server return mode. This mode has two very specific characteristics. First of all, for packets going through the load balancer, the source IP and port as well as destination IP and port are not modified. Basically, the balancer gets the packet, updates its source and destination MAC address and forwards it to the backend server. In other words, the balancing happens at layer 2 and not layer 3. Second important thing to mention is that once the backend server receives the packet, it will send the reply back directly to the client. It won't send the reply back to the balancer. There's a video where I explain that in more detail. This approach has great performance, but requires a certain networking topology. First of all, the load balancer and the backend servers needs to be on the same layer 2 segment. Second of all, 
both the balancer and real servers needs to have the same virtual IP address assigned. Lastly, the client needs to have access to the backend servers. I will go to the balancer and move the VIP to the backend network. Let's save and reload the configuration. OK, the VIP is there. Let's remove NFTables firewall configuration from the balancer and clear the EPVS configuration. I will add a new TCP service. This time the virtual IP is in the 192.168.12/24. That's the backend network. Let's keep the balancing method as round robin. Next, let's add the backend servers. I will add server 1 and server 2. Please mind that I've provided a dash G option that indicates direct routing. Let's check the setup. There's the virtual IP and the real servers all on the same network. TCP ports also match. Mind that in this method you cannot do port remapping. Packet forwarding mechanism for the virtual server is direct routing. OK, our load balancer is ready. Another thing we need to do is assign the virtual IP address to both the backend servers. Let's go to server 1, open its network configuration, and add the virtual IP to the loopback interface. Now let's save and reload the configuration. Let's check if the IP address has been assigned. OK, it's there. Let's repeat the same steps on server 2. I will open server to network configuration, add the virtual IP to the loopback, save and reload the network configuration, and check if the IP is there. OK, all looks good. Last thing we need to do is prevent the backend servers from replying to ARP requests for the VIP, as that would steal the traffic from the load balancer. There is a kernel parameter that does exactly that. It allows ETH0 to reply only to queries about its own MAC address, not MAC address of other interfaces. Also, let's not announce the VIP IP via ETH0. Let's repeat the same steps on server 2. Finally, let's test the setup. I will go to a client located on the backend network. Let's run a few requests. How it operates is a request goes to the load balancer where the MAC address is updated to one of the real servers and then the real server replies directly to the client. Let's go to a client that's on a different network but has access to the backend server. Let's try reaching to the backend server directly. Works. Let's try reaching to the backend servers via the load balancer. Also works. We'll talk about various load balancing algorithms in a different video. Today, I just want to show you how EPVS works as it's used very frequently in load balancing traffic between Kubernetes bots. Soon, I'll be starting a video series about Kubernetes networking, so please stay tuned.